Are you ready to hear the word tonight? Amen. Well, I ain't preaching, and I ha- I'm happy I ain't preaching. So uh, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, so, oh, okay, thanks a lot there, Jerry. Um, really appreciate that, brother. You know who supports you well uh, up in the church now. Um, you know, we, uh, for our one-year anniversary, you know, we had guest speakers come in, and, and it, it was wonderful, and it was great. And before that, uh, I never never gave up the mic other than the fact that I had to have two two knee surgeries to repair my ACL, and y'all know the story, and uh, we had get, we had a guest speaker uh, two or three weeks into starting the church, because right when we started the church, uh, it was a great idea for me to tear my ACL, and, and uh, we went through that whole process, and I had to have two surgeries back to back, and it was crazy, and so I had no other choice but to have guest speakers come in, and, and it was a, a wild time, um, but you know, we at, for oh, quite some time now uh, as a church, I know Melissa and I, this is, uh, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of us, but we've been praying, you know, God, you know, really send people to this church that, that are enhancers, but people that can teach and preach the word but besides us. And um, I know that we are all in general called to do that. Um, some people would, if you gave them a microphone, they would, they couldn't do nothing with it. Um, they're terrified. They're, they're scared or, or whatever it may be. Some people are not called to the platform and uh, we got to understand that, right? But some people are. And, um, and so I'm grateful that, you know, this season of time, that God has begun the process and begin nurturing this church so much so that we have people that now can come and 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 preach and teach to us, Amen. And so you'll be hearing uh, next um, next first Wednesday from Josiah, our our, our new associate pastor, Josiah, new associate pastor. So that's good. And and listen, I'm 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 about I'm about you know really investing into the heart of the people to make sure that you are flowing in your gifts and your anointing and your calling. That's what we always talk about serving. Um, I shouldn't be the only one that's ever that ever has this microphone, amen? And I'm a firm believer of that. I believe if God's given you something, that you that gift needs to be used for the kingdom of God, amen? And so um, one of our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful assets that we have at this church is, is our man, Buster. And uh, so tonight... Buster is going to be preaching to y'all, teaching to y'all uh, a word. Now, let me tell you, um, Buster, like I said about Josiah on Sunday, Buster is smarter than me, and I ain't afraid to admit it, all right? He is smarter than me, and his degree is better than the degree I have. He, this is a master's of divinity right here. He knows everything about God. No, I'm just kidding. But he knows a lot more than, than all of us do up in here because he's been taught and he's equipped and all that. And so um, y'all stand to your feet and help me for the first time ever at Church of the City. Welcome, Buster. Hi. You guys ever have one of those days where, like, literally everything that could go wrong, like, did? Like, in the hour before service, like, literally everything that could possibly have gone wrong did? So I'm the media director here at the church, which means that, like, everything that happens back there, see, like, watch this. You ready? Hang on. Let me show you a trick. See, like, from up here, I can do this. So, yeah. And, like, can you hear me? Like, I can make me a little bit louder. I'm not as loud as Austin. Is that better? So, anyway, when we got here tonight, like, my phone popped up and said, hey, do you still want to connect to the wireless network here? It's not connected to the internet. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, we just, we just, like, a week ago fired our streaming service because we couldn't go live. And, like, that's something, like, we got today, we got a refund back on, like, the $1,000 we paid them to use their service that didn't work. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> And so we signed, uh, we signed up with a new service that we started on Sunday, and it, it's, it's just, if it's going to frustrate anybody that the stuff back there is not working, it's me. And so, like, that's been my, my hour. So before we get started, like, I just want to pray um, that God would still my heart, because I've been, like, irritated for the last hour, like, getting started. And uh, how many of you guys know that usually when that happens, that means, like, the word is probably pretty good? Like... <laughs> Like, I, don't, I don't know about me, like, delivering it. We'll see how that goes. But like, I believe when, when, when this came to be that I was going to be speaking tonight, I was over at Austin's house. 
and I was at work, and I had been sharing with one of my coworkers um, on like breaking strongholds. He was talking about like a relative that has an addiction to alcohol, and and so I came over to Austin, and I was like, "Man, we got to talk about this." And he goes, "No, you've got to talk about it." And I was like, "All right, cool." So we scheduled this about a month and a half ago, and like I was planning to speak on that, and then my wife, like you know that like your wife hears the Lord better than you do, like your spouse does. And so she goes, are you going to pray about this at all? And I was like, well, I feel like this is the word. She goes, are you going to pray about it or not? And I was like, okay. So I prayed about it, and the Lord said, Mark 14. And I was like, how does that have anything to do with alcoholism at all? Like, it doesn't at all. Like, that's not at all. Like, I was going to talk about breaking strongholds. And so, like, I started writing my message on, like, breaking strongholds. And the Lord was like, no, Mark 14. And I was like, all right. So I got to digging into it. And so I got really... I feel like Mark 14 tonight is a word for our church. Like the, the passage we're going we're gonna to read tonight together is a word for our church. So let's pray. God, speak to us. Amen. I pray quick. I'm the guy you want to come over and pray for Thanksgiving dinner. In fact, I'm actually not allowed to pray for Thanksgiving dinner in my family anymore. Like four or five, like <laughs> this really happened. So at the very first year Ashley and I were together when we got married, um, I had just graduated. So I have a Bachelor of Science in Religion from Liberty University. And about six months ago, no, almost a year ago now, I graduated with my Master's of Divinity from the King Seminary. And um, so I had just graduated from Bible College. And so my family was like, hey, you can pray for Thanksgiving. And I was like, y'all don't want me to pray for Thanksgiving. I'll do it, but you don't want me to. So I was, Lord, bless the food. Amen. Yeah, I got I have not, but I don't get asked to pray anymore for, for food, so. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, verse 1. We are going to read verses 1 through 11. We good? All right. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. This keeps zooming out on me. Oh, my gosh. Y'all, we're going to have to go with real Bible. Hang on. I know how to use it. Give me a minute. All right, let's start over. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those... Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the word, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. The title of tonight's message is How to Worship a King. How to Worship a King. So this passage is mentioned in three of the four Gospels. It actually, a reference to this passage is in all four Gospels, and so... There's a lot of things that, that aren't in even two of the Gospels. So if it's in all four of them, like to me, that's pretty important. So it's in, it's in Mark 14. It's also in John chapter 12. We'll spend a little bit of time in John 12 later. Um, Matthew 26, and then the story of Martha being busy and Mary worshiping Jesus and everyone getting on to her for that, that's in uh, Luke 12. And so before we get into the, to this part of the Scripture, it's important to know, and this is, this, if there was a test, this would be on the test, so remember this for later. Um, the book of Mark is mainly concerned with answering one question. The book of Mark is concerned with answering the question, is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? That's the part that's on the test. Is Jesus the Jewish Messiah? And Mark tells us this in the very first chapter and very first verse of his book. He says, 
the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. That's the very first thing he wants you to know. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. So what's a Messiah? So a Messiah is a royal figure that Israel was expecting to come and set up a kingdom on earth. So at that time, Israel was under Roman rule. And if you can think, you can imagine your country like being occupied by another country, and it's an oppressive country. And if you fast forward about 60 years after Jesus' death, they were persecuted and killed. All of the disciples were, were murdered. Um, every single one of them died for what they believed in. And they expected this Messiah was going to come in and overthrow the Roman government and rule as king of Israel. And so when, when Mark comes in and says this Jesus who came and died, and you're still under Roman rule when he wrote the book of Mark, he was your Messiah. So it's not what you think it is. And so I want to give you three thoughts on Mary's act of worship and how that gives us a picture into Jesus as the Messiah. And so point number one is this. This is an ordinary dinner party. There's not a whole lot special about this dinner party. So Jesus was an itinerant rabbi. And, and he would go from town to town, and not just him, but many rabbis would go from town to town sharing the word and preaching and they didn't ask for any pay in return. Often they would, they would take offerings and give it to them as, as a blessing, but they, they didn't ever ask for an offering. In return, the people were expected to open their homes. And it was a privilege, and it was even expected that when these rabbis would come to your town, that you would welcome them into your home and that you would feed them and take care of them and show them hospitality. And there's a quote from a gentleman named Yoz Ben Yozer. It's probably not how you say that. Uh, from the second century BC, he says, let your house be a meeting place for the rabbis and cover yourselves in the dust of their feet and drink in their words thirstily. And so this was a common thing that happened all the time. Like as Jesus was going from town to town, he would stay in the home of friends. And this wasn't the first time he had been to Bethany. He was coming back to Bethany. Does anyone know why he came to Bethany in Mark 14 and John 12? I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because it's good. So back to this quote, if it's still up there. If not, it's fine. So there's two schools of thought on why this quote's important. The first, the first school of thought is that as your rabbi was walking down the road, that you would walk so closely behind him trying to hear what he was saying that you would be covered in the dust that he kicked up as he walked down the road. And the other school of thought is that when the rabbi was staying in your home teaching, they would be sitting on a chair or on a cushion, and everyone else in the home would sit around them at their feet and, and to learn from them, to drink in their words, especially as they shared the word. Either way, I think it works. Um, but we see Paul says in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, I'm a Jewish man born in Tarsus of Sicilia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. And so, it just that, that's a, when you studied, it was, you said that, you know, I studied at the feet of Jesus, I studied at the feet of Gamal, I studied at the feet of Paul. So that was a common thing, that this would be what we would do. So back to this passage. Why was Jesus in Bethany? He was in Bethany because he had heard that his buddy Lazarus had died. That was in John chapter 11. So now we're in chapter 12. So in uh, Luke chapter 12, I think I had this wrong. Anyway, Lazarus was there. <laughs> he was at this party. If we go back to, hang on, roll Bible again. Hold up. John 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And literally, in, uh, if you have your Bible, like chapter 11 is the death of Lazarus, and uh, he raises him from the dead. And so, John chapter 12, verse 1, tells us that, like yesterday, Lazarus was dead, but now he's not. 
and he's hanging out at your house with Jesus, and Jesus is telling stories. Like, how cool would it have been to be there? So it's an ordinary dinner, but it's not ordinary at the same time, right? So it's an ordinary night. It's an ordinary dinner party. Jesus is telling stories. Martha's making dinner. What's she making, Austin? No, 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 no. (laughs) Martha's making rolls, y'all. Martha's making, y'all ever been to, to Cheddar's? Those honey butter croissants, they, they didn't used to do this, but have y'all, like, seriously, have y'all been to Shutters lately? Like, when you sit down, they don't even ask. They just bring you this, like, platter of, like, these croissants that are, like, baptized in honey butter. <laughs> and, like, Austin had to take the, the, the platter away from me last time we went, because I was, like, trying to lick the stuff. It's so good, y'all. The only thing I think that holds a candle to these rolls are maybe the ones at Roadhouse. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, I digress. And so it doesn't take an extraordinary setting for something extraordinary to happen. So extraordinary things happen in, in ordinary, ordinary settings. Point number two. Some people will never understand. Mark 14, verse 4 and 5. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste of this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. I read that over and over again, and the word indignantly started jumping out at me when I read that. You guys know what indignant means? Feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. It's unfair that Mary was, she just broke this jar and poured out the perfume. I'm going to get into it in a little bit, but it's worth a year's wages. So it's about, in like modern times, average household income in 2018 was about $60,000. So you had a $60,000 bottle of perfume you just broke and poured over Jesus' head. But why were they upset? See, selfish people, they don't really care about the poor. They're just jealous of what you have. It's unfair, they said. It's unfair that she would waste all of this on Jesus and not give it to the poor. So side note, what did Jesus do? Or what did Judas do for Jesus? He handled the money. So it's not really that they care that you have a nice house. They just wish theirs was bigger. It's not really they care that you drive a Mercedes. They're just ashamed of their Toyota. I drive a Prius, so I can say that. It's paid off, though. (laughs) It's not really that they care that you seem to have your life together. They're just upset that they don't, their life hasn't turned out the way they think it would. You see, what is fair? Fair is getting what you deserve, but it's only getting what you deserve and nothing else. And so we have this this thing of fair and more than fair. And so you should be happy that your coworker got a promotion. You should be happy that your friend got the new car. Your time's going to come. Don't play the comparison game because it'll kill you. Some of y'all need to get off Instagram and Facebook and quit comparing the mundane part of our own lives to someone else's highlight reel. They don't show you when things are going bad, when, like, I don't post when Ashley and I have a fight about, like, spending $14 at Walmart or $6 at Chick-fil-A. It has happened. But they don't show, we don't show that stuff on, on social media. But we look at somebody else, and when they're showing, like, all the wins, they're showing all the skins they've hung up on the wall, and we get frustrated that we have to get up and go to work every day. And that we ha- like, that things don't seem to be going the way we think they should. We get locked in this game of comparison. 
And let me tell you, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. When you start comparing yourself to people, you start playing that comparison game that, you know, you find out like what your coworker makes and you were completely fine with what you made yesterday, but now you know what they make and so you're upset about what you made, but you were okay with it yesterday. You were fine until you found out what they made. Some of us were really happy with what we got paid until we found out what our coworker made. Are we still friends? <laughs> we let the bitterness get into us, it'll kill you. Y'all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get killed on this little thing in the rug here. That's dangerous, y'all. And so Judas, like this was like the tipping point for Judas, right? This was a week before Jesus died. He was full of jealousy and full of bitterness and he looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus because he was upset that Jesus took Mary's side. In chapter, or verse 10 and 11 of our, of our story in Mark 14, it says this, Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to him. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. What in your life are you willing to, to betray for 30 pieces of silver. That's not even in my notes, y'all. <laughs> what is it in our lives that we're willing to betray? What values of ours are we willing to compromise for some temporary satisfaction? Like we know that just a few chapters later, Judas hangs himself. Was it worth it? Man, this is better than I thought it was. <laughs> point number three is this. Hold up. My point number three is much longer than his point number three, so I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> this is that message. I had to just get through like point one and two because point three is really what I want to talk about tonight. Is it already up there? Ooh. So how you worship is an indicator of who or what you worship. So of course it's an extravagant gift. Of course it was. We already talked about it. It was about $60,000. John 12, 3 says it was a pint of pure nard. That's like 16 ounces, two cups. That's like essential oil, like 16 ounces of it. And it was worth 300 denarii, so 300 days of pay. It's actually more than about 60 grand because there's about 260 working days in the year if you work like a normal five days a week. And in 2018, we've had a little bit of inflation since then because the economy is awesome. I won't get political, I promise. But if you like having more money in your paycheck, just saying. So 300 days of pay, it, it, you do the math, is more than $60,000 of, of this oil. But her gift was more significant than you think. I told you there would be a test at the end, in the beginning. So what was Mark about? Is Jesus the Messiah? What does the word Messiah mean? It means the anointed one. So most of this message comes out of a, uh, out of a book that, that we studied in, in my master's program. Right here. Not making it up. It's called Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus by Ann Spangler and Lois Tverberg. So I want to read you a, uh, a little paragraph out of the book. And I'm really good at reading like the first two chapters of books. I have like a whole library of books that I've read like 30 pages of each one of them. So luckily this comes from page 16. <laughs> I 
I'm honest at least. It actually is in chapter one. (laughs) So it says this, instead of being crowned during a coronation, Hebrew kings were anointed with sacred oil perfumed with extremely expensive spices. Only used for consecrating objects in the temple and for anointing the priests and kings, the sacred anointing oil would have been more valuable than diamonds. The marvelous scent that it left behind acted like an invisible crown conferring an aura of holiness on its recipients. Everything and everyone with that unique fragrance was recognized as belonging to God in a special way. And so the majesty of a king was expressed not only by what they wore. They did wear jewelry and and crowns and robes and all of that. But by a royal aroma. You could smell them coming. The Bible says about King David in Psalms chapter 45. Verse 7 and 8 if you're taking notes. Your love and righteous... You... Not your... You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Mary anointed Jesus as king right before Palm Sunday. This is Saturday. Palm Sunday was the next day. So like... Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, got anointed as king, and then he rode into Jerusalem the next day. And when he rode into Jerusalem the next day, he had the fragrance and the aroma of a king. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Just It's an exact picture of how Solomon had done, Solomon had done four or five hundred years previous. And he had the aroma of a king. Y'all ever been around somebody who wears essential oils? They put like three drops of that stuff on it. You can smell them like in like the other room. Like it only takes a few drops. Can you imagine if you poured two cups of that on somebody? Like how long they would smell and how strong the aroma would be? Like think about it. So we have this... Uh, this detergent at home called Diva Wash. All right, so don't buy it. This stuff is like stupid expensive. It's like 100 bucks for a gallon of this stuff. It's stupid. It is awesome. Um, but you can wash like a blanket with this stuff, and then like a month later, it still smells just like the day you washed it. So we have like throw blankets that you like fold and put on the couch. It'll like make your like... Ashley washed our bedding with it like a month ago, and I didn't know she did. I walked in the front door and could smell it from the front door of the house. You used two ounces of this stuff, like diluted in like, I don't know how many gallons of water are in your, uh, in your washing machine. Our bedroom smelled for like three weeks. Could you imagine pouring 16 ounces of pure oil, of this fragrant oil they used to anoint kings, how long you would smell? Imagine this. Jesus gets anointed king with this fragrant oil. He rides into Jerusalem on Sunday. And then we have the week of the passion, right? He dies on, I think, Friday. When he was crucified, he had the aroma of a king. They even gave him a crown and a purple robe. He was dressed And had the aroma of a king, y'all. While they were beating him, while they were driving the nails into his hands, into his feet, he had the aroma of a king. When the Roman soldiers, this wasn't just an, an Israelite thing. When the Roman soldiers were nailing the nails into his wrists and into his feet, they had to smell it. When they were beating him on his back and ripping his flesh, he smelled like a king. He had the aroma of a king. When he was hanging on the cross, when he died, when he took his last breath, he had the aroma of a king.
Can we go one level deeper? First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You should have the fragrance of a king. So here's our word from the Lord. I told you we had, I had a word from, from the Lord for our church tonight. How do you smell? Do you stink? Do you even have a smell? When you walk into a room, do you carry the royal aroma of the king of kings? Do people know that you carry the presence of God before you have to tell them you carry the presence of God? Can I share a story with you guys? So, about about a, about a decade ago, um, I went to to visit a friend of mine in California, and um, I won't share his name because I don't know if he wants this story told or not. But I'm gonna tell it anyway. And luckily, we're not on Facebook, so I'll get his permission maybe before we share it. Um, but he was literally living a double life at the time. He had he had taken advantage of his wife and her dad was paying for them to live in Los Angeles and um, and I came to visit them and I had no idea like I just I just came out I was going to school I had just started at the King Seminary and I was out there to take two classes taught by Jack Hayford which you ever get a chance to like sit five feet from Jack Hayford. He gave me half of his jelly donut one day. Different story. And um, I gladly received. It was delicious. But I just came out and stayed with with my buddy. I had no idea this was going on at the time. And and one night we were eating. Uh, we ordered in dinner. I was there for about a week. About I guess eight or nine days. And um, in the middle of, of being at their house, uh, we were eating, it was fig and goat cheese pizza, y'all. Californians are weird. It was good. The Californians are weird. Like, who puts fig and goat cheese on a pizza? Anyway, so we, I, we're eating this fig and goat cheese pizza. And, like, I take a bite, and, like, I set it down, and I look over at his wife, and I just looked at her, and I said, you got a spirit of depression. Get out. And, like, she jumped up and, like, ran to the other room, and, like, I didn't know what had happened. Like, it just, like, just flowed out, right? And um, they were gone for, like, an hour. So I'm sitting in there with their two kids, and I'm, like, eating pizza, and I'm, like, what in the world just happened? And so he comes back in the room about an, about an hour later and says, man, my wife, like, she just got in the shower. She said that she feels clean for the first time in years. And so then I come home, right? That's not, that is cool. That's not the whole point of the story. So um, I, I came home and like fast forward like five years. And I, I went to, um, to see my friend, him and his wife, like after I left, they almost got a divorce. Um, they worked it all out. They went to counseling and all the stuff that had been in the darkness came to the light, all of that. And so I went to, to an event where uh, at this ministry he was working at, um, he had been a worship pastor like for many years, and he was working this, uh, this ministry event, and his father-in-law, so the father of, of, this, of his wife was there. And um, I showed up, and he came over, and he goes, man, I've waited five years to meet you. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he goes, I knew. I knew what was going on before they ever even left to go to California. He goes, but God told me he was going to send somebody to set them free. I had no idea, y'all. I just went out there to go to school. And so I'm, I'm talking to my friend like, after this had happened. And he said, he goes, man, he goes, 
the moment you walked in the door of our house, it was like a wind blew and like blew all the dust out. He was like, like from that moment forward, like the status quo wasn't even possible. Because there was a presence that I carried into their house when I walked in. I wasn't even aware that I carried it, y'all. There was a presence that I carried when I walked into their house that disrupted the deception that had been going on. And they were set free just because I walked into their house. That doesn't say a whole lot about me. Like, I'm not, I'm not some special guy. But when you minister to the Lord, when you carry the Lord's presence, everywhere you go, you don't have to say anything. It's on you. The enemy can smell it. So that's our word for tonight is how do you smell? Nathan, you can come up. Jordan, everybody. So in the Old Testament, worship was actually an activity. You think about animal sacrifice in, in the Old Testament, it's often described as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the ones who would carry out the worship in the Old Testament, so it wasn't like it is now, right? Like back then, in order to like minister to the Lord, you had to be a member of the priesthood. You had to be a Levite. You had to, you had to be born into it, into the right tribe. And it was their job. Every day, they ministered to the Lord. Thousands of animals, they would you know, they'd cut them up and burn them on the altar as an offering to the Lord. And that was how they worshiped in the Old Testament. But we've been made a royal priesthood. And so the fragrance aroma that the priest would use to minister to the Lord, now we do that. And Psalms 22 tells us about the, oh, hold up. See, when you're, when you're like the guy preaching and also the sound guy, I have to unmute things. Bear with me. Stay in this hole. But I'm using an app, so I don't know how to, hang on. We'll get there. Ooh, there it is. All right, there we go. Is it up there? About the Lord, but you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. God is enthroned on the praises of his people. That's why we place such an incredibly high value on worship in this church. That's why, like, don't get me wrong, the word is good, but if we didn't do anything, if all we did was come together and worship him for an hour and go home, that'd be enough. Like, we need the word, we need the edification, we need the encouragement. But if we didn't do anything else but worship him, that would be enough. And you see these churches that that have like exploded, right? Like everyone likes to talk about like Bethel and Elevation and even Gateway up the road. They all place an extremely high value on worship. That's the one thing. It's the most important thing that we can do. If you want to walk in the power of God, if you want to live a life of, in the blessing and of blessing, you got to start with worship. And the good news is, you don't have to wait. You can do that right now. You guys want to stand to your feet? This is how I find my battles. 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 This is how. Yeah. 
for just a second. Come on. God, we worship you tonight. God, we exalt you, Lord. We lift you up right now, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Come on, you don't need words. You can worship right now. You can worship right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 Lord, worship you, God. You know, I love what Buster said tonight about, right here at the very end, about, about it starting with worship. And, uh, you know, that's what it really is all about. Our, our life should be a daily reflection of who Jesus is. Amen? And, and it should. Uh, and and the, problem, the problem that we have is exactly what he was talking about tonight, is that we don't have people smelling the way they're supposed to smell. Uh, but you can... You can put on that smell, if you will. You can put on that aroma in worship. Amen? In worship. And, you know, it's interesting, Buster, that you told them to do this song. Uh, and I don't think I've ever even shared this with you. 
the girl that wrote the song, her name is Alyssa Smith, is a friend of mine, and this song has literally blown up all over the world, and it's become a, a declaration of, unlike any other song, it's really powerful, right? I used to sit in class next to Alyssa every single day, and Alyssa was the most quiet, she never said a word, never talked to nobody, never told anybody she can sing, let alone write music. And I remember many times just because I was next to her being paired up with her for different, um, different things that we would do in class. And um, just to try to get her to say a word was nearly impossible. And I could never figure out why. And then all of a sudden, one day, she's serving at Upper Room and starts singing. And this whole thing just blows up and things go crazy. And this song takes off and it's, it is where it is today. And I remember thinking to myself, how in the world did this little girl, I mean, I'm telling you, she's tiny, short. How, how did little old quiet Alyssa write this powerful of a song? when she would never even, never even say a word in class. And it's exactly what Buster said tonight. It's because little quiet Alyssa didn't say much in public, but her expression that she was having in her secret place, in her private place, was a lot louder than her voice was in the public place. And God took what was inside of her in private, her worship. This is how I fight my battles. I don't know the heart behind this song. I don't know if she was dealing with something or whatever it may have been. But I can tell you that, like, God has used her voice, quiet Alyssa, to change hundreds, if not millions, across the world with this song not because she's a loud voice publicly it's because she has a voice privately and God cultivated that thing in the secret place but it was all formed out of worship this song is about worship but clearly God has used this because of what has happened in her worship and so I say that all to say not not that I know her okay that's not the point I say that to say this if God can take a quiet young lady like that and use something in her worship to shape shake and change and transform a whole entire globe what can he do with your worship her worship you can smell across the country you can smell across the world it's on album after album after album right now what about your worship what about your worship it's exactly what he said tonight when you enter into a room, do you smell like the king? Have you been spending time with the king somehow during your day? Do you smell like worship? I didn't know what he was going to preach on. He actually texted me last night and said, do you want to review over my notes? And I said, no. I said, I trust you and I trust God. I need to look. I think this is a good reminder for us tonight to not only get into the quiet secret place with God but to literally saturate ourselves in an atmosphere and a heart of worship amen come on amen